And we were talking, and he started talking about this uh, Bob Cousy, and I'm like, Coos, him saying Coos. And I said, are you talking about the Bob Cousy? He said, yeah. He says, I grew up with him. He's obviously a young person. And we were friends of the family. We knew each other forever. And then he then introduced me to him, and I met him. And we start talking, and not Bob didn't say anything, but some of his friends said, this is something that, uh, that basically he aspired for. So you called me, and we were having a meeting on something else. We were back having lunch. And we were talking, and you, in your, in your personal fashion, I said, uh, there's a gentleman I think you ought to consider for this high award. And you said, well, who would that be? And I said, Bob well, Cousy. You said, I remember him very well. Remember we were sitting back there? Sure. You said, give us a number and we'll call him. You made the phone call back there. He wasn't going to take the phone call because he thought someone said, this is a White House call. The president wanted to speak to you. He said, they're, they're jousting me. So they took the call, and he says, it's unbelievable. So. Uh, to all the friends, this is a team effort. It was this whole family and all these people who grew up with Bob and Coos know it's been a team effort to make this happen. I was just happen, ha happy that I could be a part of this. And uh, thank you, Mr. President, for well, recognizing a big part true of the American hero. Yeah, thank you very much, thank Joe. You, thank you, Gail, very much for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you. Also with us are many members of the Coosie family, including Bob's daughters, Mary, Cindy, and Marie. Where are you now? Where are you? Hello, folks. Congratulations. Big, it's a big deal. And his grandchildren, Zachary and Nicole. Thank you. Congratulations. And his sons-in-law, Randy, Bruce, and Joseph. And they're good sons-in-law, I assume, Bob, right? Eh? No complaints? They stay in line. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> I'll bet they are. Bob grew up during the Great Depression on Manhattan's East 83rd Street in an apartment without running water. In 1941, at the age of 13, Bob picked up a basketball for the very first time. He devoted himself to the sport and soon honed a unique ability to play equally well with both hands. He had a very unique talent. He had equal ability with both hands, they say. I won't ask you whether or not that's true. Is it true? So so. Uh, yeah. It's pretty pretty unique. And Bob never forgot the lesson his first mentor taught him. Don't ever be predictable. Hey, I've heard that lesson too. <laughs> Not for basketball, for other things. By his senior year of high school, Bob was named captain of the Journal Americans All Scholastic Team, and people started calling him the Houdini of the Hardwood. It started very early. It's called talent. And you either have it or you don't. In 1946, Bob enrolled at College of the Holy Cross and joined the Crusaders, where he quickly built a large following of fans. In one of the biggest games of his sophomore year, his coach, for whatever reason, benched him. I'll bet that's the only time that ever happened. The team was behind by seven points with only five minutes left to play. It was a very, very important game. When the fans started going crazy, we want koozie, we want koozie. A lot of fans, to 8,000, that's a lot at that time. The coach had no choice but to put Bob in in a game, and Bob immediately went on to score 12 quick points, leading his team to a epic come-from-behind victory. And I don't know if the coach kept his job or not, but uh, I don't know. What do you think, Joe? I think I would have gotten rid of the coach. By the end of his collegiate career, the Wizard of Worcester was a three-time All-American and was on his way to being drafted into the NBA. Everybody was talking about him. They were talking about him all over the country. Joining the Boston Celtics in 1950, Bob quickly established himself as the preeminent point guard of his day. He was ranked number one in assists for eight of his 13 NBA seasons, uh, all of which were spent with a team known as the Boston Celtics, great team. By his second season, he was the third highest scorer in the league. In a legendary 1953 playoff game between the Celtics and the Syracuse Nationals, Bob demonstrated exceptional grit in one of the roughest games in the history of basketball, including 107 fouls. That's a lot of fouls. Bob forced the game into its first of four overtimes and propelled the way to victory, scoring a record 50 points. And Boston won by quite a bit, because he just went wild in that last overtime. In 1954, Bob organized the NBA Players Association, a first-of-its-kind union for major American sports. He was elected 
the association's first president and fought for better working conditions and a more reasonable schedule for players. Bob's activism helped him produce many notable reforms, including a pension plan for NBA players. Bob was also a passionate advocate for equality and justice. At Holy Cross, he wrote his senior thesis on the persecution faced by minorities. While playing for the Celtics, Bob heard that his friend Chuck Cooper, the first African-American drafted into the NBA, could not stay in the same hotel as the rest of the team in the segregated South. Bob responded by leaving the state with his teammate. And he wasn't a happy person, and he became very happy because what happened after that is very legendary. Bob was right at the forefront. Throughout his long career, Bob was a voice against prejudice, racism, and bigotry. After 1,026 games for the Celtics, Bob retired from the team in 1963. He had scored 18,973 points and made 7,882 assists. They were records at the time. He was a six-time NBA champion, a 13-time NBA All-Star. Wow. And he was also league MVP. He was the first NBA player to be on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Bob went on to coach the Boston College basketball team to a 117 and 38 record. In 1973, he coached the U.S. national team to a victory against the Soviet Union. He was inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame in 1971 and later became the first inductee to serve as its president. He coached the Cincinnati Royals and briefly reactivated in 1969, setting the record for the oldest person to play in the NBA. Am I allowed to ask how old that was? Uh, I'm having a senior moment, Mr. <laughs> President. I, I, I think it was 41. That's very good. That's pretty good. Over the years, Bob has also poured his heart in countless charitable causes. He was named the Big Brother of the Year in 1965, taught youth basketball, and created a scholarship for underprivileged children. It's an incredible life. Incredible life you've done. Great job, Bob. Thank you. But you're one of the all-time greats in the history of sports, not just basketball, and an inspiration to us all. And today, America honors and celebrates everything that you have achieved. You've achieved so much, and even beyond basketball. It is my privilege to ask the military aide to read the citation as we present Robert Bob Cousy with the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Please. Robert Joseph Bob Cousy is one of basketball's all-time greatest players. During his 13 seasons with the Boston Celtics, the Houdini of the hardwood confounded opponents and was instrumental in building the team into a legendary success. Mr. Cousy won six NBA championships with the Celtics, led the league in assists for eight straight years, was a 13-time All-Star, and won the NBA's Most Valuable Player Award in 1957. Off the court, he fought for racial equality by standing up to racism directed at his teammates, and he helped organize the NBA Players Association. In 1971, he was inducted into the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame. The United States proudly honors Mr. Cousy, whose competitiveness and character have solidified him as a distinguished athlete and American. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. 
good. Take your time. So I'm in good shape. You take your time. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President, for those kind words. However, if I'd known I was going to be eulogized, I'd have done the only decent thing and died for you. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I've got to, I, I think I've got to, at 91, I've got to stop using that line. I think that line, I think, I think the good Lord has heard it once too often, and he's ready to tell one of his aides, hey, I, I think that sucker wants to come up. I hope he says up with us, uh, <laughs> yank him up. Anyway, Mr. President, I know in your world, you're well on your way to making America great again. In my world, it's been great for 91 years. Only in America could my story have been told. I'm here to say that I'm easily the most fortunate, lucky SOB on the planet. Fabricated overseas, followed by a 17-year ghetto experience in early life, I discovered some God-given skills to play a child's game and landed without much of a moral code other than the law of the streets, survival and self-interest, at the College of the Holy Cross, then and now, one of the finest liberal arts schools in the country, where my Jesuit mentors, in answer to the eternal questions, what's it all about, why are we here, what's our raison d'etre, advised, maximize your God-given skills in the areas of your choice, and then reach out in your communities and help in any way you can those who are less fortunate, those who need a boost. And to the best of my ability, I've tried, and I'd like to think that the good Lord has rewarded my feeble attempts by surrounding me at this point in my life at this wonderful event. <coughs> oh boy, I screwed it up there, no. Uh, friends who have my back, My two wonderful grandchildren who, let's, let's introduce you guys one more time, Nick, I'm Nick, Nicole and Zach. Uh, two loving daughters, both with devoted partners and both who hover over me and make sure that I take my pills on time. <laughs> I can't ask all those friends to stand and be identified, but I would like to pay special tribute to my friend Senator Joe Manchin from West Virginia, who was directly responsible for my presence here today to receive this award. And I'd like my daughters, Marie and Tish, I know you took one bow, just a quick wave, guys. They are both retired school teachers, both with distinguished careers in education, and both wonderful replicas of their mother. Sorry about that. Missy, who put up with me for 63. That's why you shouldn't invite old men to the White House. <laughs> we get emotional. Uh, 63 wonderful years while trying in her way to make the world a better place. So as Exhibit A, for that earlier reference to my good fortune, I refer to why we're here this afternoon. This acknowledgement allows me to complete my life circle. I can stop chasing the bouncing ball. The Presidential Medal of Freedom allows me to reach a level of acceptance in our society I never once ever dreamed of. And it's very special for two other reasons. It allows me to join one of the most exclusive clubs on our planet. And secondly, Mr. President, and I've lost the last sheet. No, I'm sorry. 
Secondly, Mr. President, it's special because it is being presented by the most extraordinary president in my lifetime. And I'm a BR before Roosevelt. So. <laughs> anyway, thank you, sir. That's so nice, thank you. Thank you, all my friends and fam. Thank you for your attendance and your attention. Peace. Thank you. Well, I just want to say that, uh, first of all, that was beautiful. And uh, congratulations to the family and all your friends. And the last one, uh, last great athlete to get it was Tiger Woods about three months ago. I Tiger saw it all. I'm a Tiger fan. And he, I'm a Tiger yes. fan, too. And he's, uh, he did a great job. He, he did something that people thought was impossible. And he won the Masters, and he, he was something. So uh, you're in very good company. There's some incredible people, as you know, in the past. I, I, I have been. And I, I, I think I mentioned to you when we spoke in December that if I ever get back to golf, I'm going to give you two aside. Okay. That sounds, good. <laughs> that sounds good. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. And I just want to, again, congratulate Bob and his family. And uh, thank you all. And Joe, thank you for that reference. That was a reference uh, when Joe Manchin called Senator Manchin. He said, uh, I have an idea, Bob Cousy. I said, done. He said, you don't want to think? I said, no, I don't have to think about it. What's to think about? I know his life. I know how great an athlete he was. I also know he's done great things beyond that. So that was a very quick acceptance. I didn't have to call you back, Joe. I saved the phone call. So uh, thank you very much for that reference. And uh, we're very proud of Bob Cousy. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Congratulations. No, the job numbers have been really good. Uh, we have uh, unemployment at a level that it hasn't been at for many, many years. Uh, fantastic numbers. The economy has been really fantastic. If you look at the world economy, not so good, but the economy has been really fantastic. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much. We're finished. Thank you. Come on.